I'm Tom Smalley, uh, one of the co-founders of Anxiety and Athletes, um, one of the lead advocates with the IOCDF. And with me, I have Krista Mackle, one of our task force members. She serves as the director of mental health and clinical services and the lead clinical counselor for student athletes with the University of Pittsburgh Athletic Department. She's a LCSW, the co-founder of the Center of Grit and Growth. For over 15 years, Kristen has provided clinical mental health services to high performing individuals, including NCAA D1 athletes, professional athletes, and Olympians. She has expertise treating mood and anxiety disorders and is listed on the United States Olympic and Paralympic Mental Health Registry. Also with us, we have Penny Samea. Penny, did I get your name right? Yeah, uh, Samea. Samea? Yeah, correct. All right, awesome. Good. Uh, that, was, that was the first time, everybody. That was, uh, that was impressive. All right, so Penny, 17 years in student athlete development, 23 total years at Pitt. You started there as a student athlete, now to executive staff. Um, oversees a nationally recognized life skills program, so clearly has a lot of experience in, in life after sport. Um, worked with professional athletes through Huddle Up, and uh, seven-year average in his career of 98.5% career outcomes for graduating student athletes at University of Pittsburgh within six months. Um, worked with different school districts, American Samoa through the Troy and Theodora uh, Pal Palomalu Foundation and some nonprofit work nonprofit work around Pittsburgh. So we're really, really excited to have Penny with us. Um, so we'll jump right into it. You know, this is a topic that I've seen as a as a strength coach in college. Um, I've had athletes come back to me after and keep in touch with me after graduating. And life after sport just isn't isn't often talked about, or you know, athletes aren't prepared for that, right? They play you know, maybe they start when they're five years old, they pick up their first football, they pick up a, a baseball glove and, you know, they might dedicate their life early on to a sport. And a what we're seeing nowadays is early specialization in sports. Um, you know, I've always been a, a big uh, advocate for playing as many sports as possible when you're young, because it's really important to try new things and it decreases the chance to burn out later on. But a lot of times what we're seeing is, is early specialization. So when they get to that, you know, 22 year old age and for for a lot of athletes in the college realm there isn't a professional career ahead of them and all of a sudden their career ends abruptly in the playoffs they lose in the semifinals at a championship and just like that it's done and they're they're asked to look for what's next and it's a huge question mark for them for a lot of kids and i'm interested to see how both of you at university of pittsburgh how, how you guys have been you know developing students for at that afterlife of, of sport. And, um, you know, Penny, if you could tell me a little bit more about the, the life skills program that, that you've developed as well. Yeah, Tom, and first, let me just start off by apologizing. I actually mispronounced pronounced my own last name. So let me correct it before my elders and ancestors come down on me. It is Samaya. So Samaya. I apologize. Samaya. Yeah. Um, but no, um, yeah, so in the, the years I've been at Pitt, one has just been a, a fortunate opportunity and a blessing to be at Pitt um, throughout my entire career. Really, some of the things that that we understand and focus on with the student athlete population is is knowing that there's three key areas of their experience um, that we help them with. And we, meaning the university and the athletic department, um, first and foremost, they have their academic pursuits which Pitt is a top um, institution, nationally recognized and well-known. Their athletic performance and opportunities there. We have championship programs and just high performing um, uh, coaches and support systems for them. And the third element is really where our life skills comes into play along with um, Kristen and our, our mental health support team. And that's in their personal growth and development. Um, Back in the 90s, late 90s, Pitt was selected as a pilot institution for what was called the CHAMPS Life Skills Program under the mm. NCAA, um, acronym standing for Challenging Athletes' Minds for Personal Success. Um, we started the Life Skills Program by having a first-time, full-time staff member, which was me. <laughs> I was the first person hired in Life Skills in 2005, and um, you know what we did then 
was really look at my personal experiences and my teammates' personal experiences, many of which were still competing, um, and looked at the gaps. You know, my myself and two of my roommates who both went on to play in the NFL, we actually used to keep a three-subject notebook, purple, mead, and we used to sit in the living room after those summer workouts and just talk about like, man, what were some of the things we wish we learned while we were at Pitt? And we were writing down simple things like, changing a tire, you know, uh, saving for a car. Like, um, you yeah. know, I had a teammate, Chris Wilson, um, who was an economics major, and he would have a habit of balancing his checkbook after every time we came home from the Chinese buffet. You know, <laughs> we got to lean on each other, witness each other. So I took a lot of those life lessons as well as support from our administrators and really started to dive into the gaps that we saw within Pitt. Fortunately, through um, generous donors like Kathy and John Pelusi, who are the namesake of our life skills program, we were able to grow and evolve um, really almost in like three year progressions. And now we're we have the largest life skills staff in the country by staff with 10 full time staff members. Um, That's terrific. And yeah, it, it's, it's been a true blessing, which is why I never left. Right. It's, right. Um, you know, Pitt, the administration, they believe in helping our student athletes. I believe in it. Um, our donors believe in it. So we want to make sure we put our best foot forward. So every year is, is like uh, an evolution. Back in our days when Kristen and I actually, little known fact, we were classmates mm -hmm. <laughs> walking the streets of Oakland, Pennsylvania together. Um, you know, our generation was told, you know, we got to keep up with the Joneses. And then as we evolved and went into adulthood and we saw this generation trying to keep up with the Kardashians. Now it's not even playing catch up or keep up. It's really trying to get ahead and it's constantly evolving. That's a lot of the analogies I use. So from 2004 when social media hit and it really started right. to stem into people's personal brands and, and really their own identity, that's the baseline that I've witnessed is their identity within athletics and outside of athletics. So right. for us, our mission is to work on a proactive side. How can we be proactive in helping them with the tools, the knowledge, the resources to help them expand beyond the scope of just being an athlete? For sure, for sure. Kristen, feel free to add anything, yeah. um, you I, know. I think from mental health's perspective, that is one of the conversations that we have on physical day. Like we started sure. then is what do you want to do, right? Like who right. are you outside of, of your sport, right? Because your sport is the thing that you do. It's not who you are. And right. the qualities that make you an elite athlete are completely yeah. translatable to being an employee, to being a partner, to being a parent. Right. You were not born with the gift of fast feet. And so how did you develop those? Right? right. How did you develop that ability to pay attention to film for hours and hours? Right. How can we take these skills? And I think it's really interesting because on physical day, I'm like, hi, my name's Kristen. I'm here to help you with your mental health while you're at the University of Pittsburgh. What are what are your plans for when your sport is done with you or when you're done with your sport? Right. And a lot of people are like, I just got here. Right. You only you only got a couple years to really kind of fine tune who you are as a young person. And I think the hard part is is that college is the transient period in our lives, right? Our classes change, our roommates change, our teammates change, our schedules change. And so it leaves a lot of people feeling really um on unstable ground, right? Even because when you came from high school, you had the same thing pretty much every day. Right. And so learning this new routine is very hard. And I think what Penny and I did independently and then found out about is that we decided that we wanted to give our student athletes credit for learning these life skills. Right. right. In my realm, I talk about money and sex and all of these things that people don't know how to how to navigate and who to turn to on a daily basis. And Penny's got a staff of 10 that is like, hey, I'm, re I'm ready and willing. Like we, we have programming for this. How do we get the right people there? So right. we both started thinking about what, how can we get our student athletes to really show up and learn and digest this information that we have that we firsthand know is really important. 
And so together, we created this three credit class that we run for our incoming student athletes where, where we address these topics that, I mean, it's designed to level the playing field, right? So that everybody who walks in has a baseline knowledge and is equipped with skills, right? To work throughout their college career. And then Penny has a follow-up class where he works with our student athletes on their way out, mm-hmm. right? And I think that that's really important is, is that come somebody's final year of competition, if we know about it, those are conversations that we have. Do you know about health insurance? Do you know what medications you're on? Do you know how to write your resume, right? Like these are these are things that we're both doing in our in our separate silos that are very overlapping. And so it makes sense that we partner on a lot of stuff. No, it's great. I mean, I think it's definitely important because I think about, obviously this isn't related to sport, but similarly, like I, when I was diagnosed with OCD, I was in treatment for so long that I felt like after I got out of treatment, I didn't have an identity. Sure. And so I was feeling so lost in what, what I, who I was and I had to figure that out. But it's very similar to these athletes, you know, a lot of, I can't imagine the, t- the amount of times I can't count the amount that on my hand, the amount of times it's an athlete came up to me and said, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm a lacrosse player for our school mm-hmm. or whatever. You know what I mean? They always led with their sport. And so yeah. it's, you know, what happens after senior year or grad year, whatever it is when they can't lead with that sport. And so I, it's phenomenal that you guys are getting athletes to see that earlier on than having them wait till after that sport is is taken from them. And honestly, I think it goes to that. We talk about the things that we wish that we had known in a way that doesn't say like, we know better than you or the adults in the Mm -hmm. room. It's Penny. I don't know if you know this, but you gave a quote on Sunday at football and I've heard about it many times. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in fruit salad. And I think right. That this is kind of that idea is that, what do you do with all of this, right? Like, you know, your sport, how do we turn it into the rest of your life? Kristen, that's so great that you said that because that's actually the hallmark of what I want our, our student athletes to understand whenever we have the, the opportunity to be in their presence is I just met with women's soccer and I said the same exact thing. You know, we're giving you so much knowledge so you yeah. can turn it into wisdom. Yeah. And I think a lot of it comes with having like the, uh, the confidence to write to fail, mm-hmm. right? I, I often find that the people that are the most afraid to fail live very small lives, right? And that's not a criticism, that's not a judgment. It's that if you can't fathom how to recover from failing, then, then you're only going to do the things that have proven to be safe, right? And I always think about, I'll ask people to think about like the ESPN highlights, right? They are like one inch, one centimeter, one second away of not being the top 10 greatest plays, but the greatest flops, right? You, right. you have to be courageous to be vulnerable in order to be confident. And I think that those are the things that we try really hard to point out is that athletics gives you a lot of confidence, but you have to look at the, the equation, right? You didn't show up on day one with confidence. I mean, like if you did great for you, I didn't. Right. Yeah. But it's by showing up and living through it and failing and figuring out how to put my feet back under me over and over that that's a skill that translates, whether it's applying to grad school, starting a new career, right. Becoming, you know, whatever version of yourself you want to be after you're done with your sport. Right. And so, you know, a question for you guys is what's kind of some of the biggest challenge challenges you faced with um, getting athletes to see, other parts of themselves and to find that identity. Getting them to not wear the gear. That's my challenge. I say like, when you wear your gear, you're easily identifiable and people will be drawn to you, but you don't, you don't always know why. And so starting when someone is either considering like walking away from their sport before their eligibility is over, or, you know, how are they going to move on post eligibility as I ask them to, to go to class in like non gear items and just see what it's like to have people want to interact with you because of who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. Not, not the number on your back or the thing that you do. Right. 
You know, one of the things I, I and I love that, Chris, and that you challenged them with that because I'm now going to co-sign and join your, <laughs> your army to do so. Um, and, and when I meet with every recruit from every single sport, and I reemphasize this when they're on campus, is a, a statistic that I had learned in, in my own development, and that's 80% of someone's opinion of us is made up within the first 30 seconds before we mm -hmm. speak. So we, we allude that all the time from a professional space into first impressions. But what I share with them is it's also our everyday people watching. When they're on the recruiting visit, they're observing, they're looking. You are that mind thinking 80% of someone is this mm -hmm. because you're just looking at them and now turn it around on you. So when you walk into a room for the first time in front of a group of strangers, what are the key things you want them to think about you? And, and that's where we dive in from our class with Kristen for our first year student athletes, even in our um, class for our transitioning student athletes, we constantly focus in on their values assessment. What are what are the values that are important to you? What are the things that that you equate to being most important? Yeah, I like that you posed it as an interview, kind of because I think that that when we're getting ready to talk about leaving, right? Like when you're being recruited, people are coming saying, "I want you, I want you," and then you then you just pick, right? Like I mean, there's right. probably some more thought put in it, but in essence, you just pick, right? right. And either it works out or it doesn't, and then you pick again. <laughs> But it's the idea that when you have to find a doctor or a boss or a partner, like you're not just like putting yourself out there to be chosen. This is an active interaction. And so how do you start to be the person that's like, what, what are you going to add to my life? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, what are, what are you bringing to the table? And do I want to choose you or do I not? Right? Like, instead of saying like, well, you're the only option. Right. Like how, how do we say no? I think that's a big thing that that we spend a lot of time talking about is assertive communication is not aggressive communication. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget the first time someone was like, I can't have a conversation. It's a confrontation. I was like, no, no, we missed we missed that. Um, and so we talk about communication style. Right. How do you communicate assertively and clearly what you want and what you need and what you don't want and what you don't need? Right. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious, um, you know, your your guys' experience with how is it different um, working with athletes with mental health disorders um, and helping them find that identity, whether um, it be after sport or if they're transitioning out of their sport, whatever it is. Um, it, do you feel there is a difference with, with athletes that have mental health disorders compared to athletes that don't? I would say that it, that's too broad of a statement for me to get on board with Tom. Each person, right, is individual and every person's, five out of five people have mental health. Mental right. health and mental illness are not synonyms, right? And I think that what we are able to do is to say, okay, here are the challenges that are presented to you. What are you going to look for? And so with regards to mental health and medical care, right, it's how do we find you a provider in the community? How do we look and see what your insurance benefits are? How do we navigate and role play and plan for the things that are coming up for change? And yet we're going to do those same things for our students that don't have a diagnosable <laughs> mental health illness as well, right? Or right. mental health disorder. Um, so I, I'd say that while there's extra care to make sure that someone knows who their providers are, mm -hmm. we're preparing them in the, the same individual way that we right. would pretty much in every, every one of our student athletes. Right. I mean, I think that goes hand in hand with us as a in in the world as a society wanting diagnosis faster and making sure there's enough care for everybody um well, I know and i in college athletics i do think right that there is penny's team is 10 my team is three and a half right like you do have access to resources in an instant and immediate way right you right. don't wait to have an appointment with me if you need to see the psychiatrist i'll get you an appointment in a day or two in the outside of college athletics world, you might have to wait months to see a psychiatrist and weeks at best to see a therapist. And so right. I think that one of the things that 
we encourage our students to do is to use all the resources afforded to them by the university as a whole, by the athletic department as a specialty, right? What, what do they have access to so that when they do leave, they're prepared as best as possible? Right. Okay. And, and to Kristen's um, point, you know, for us, we understand our role in the space that we are in. So we're not licensed in any area where we can care for them for, um, for anything they need with counseling. So we, we make sure that we are proactive in our services. And one of the things that we evolved to, I've been, it took me about three years to map this out and plan it accordingly, but we launched it the year of COVID. And personally, I don't think it could have been a, a better time for the need. And what it is, is our personalized education model. You know, we have a staff of 10. So what we did is we took those 10 and we made them life skills advisors and point people specific to teams. For our larger team like football, we have three. But for our gymnastics team, we actually have a um, gymnastics alumni who's on our staff. So it, it really helps that five out of our 10 staff, we all wore a pit jersey of some type. Yeah, for sure. Two additional wore a, a college athletics jersey in their own right and our other two um or our, our other three um are pit grads so for us it's it's not that you have to be a student athlete or have to be a pit grad it's just nice that we had that in the in the staff that we have so we we are relatable both to our student athletes and they are relatable to us um but we also understand i'm not everyone's cup of tea so if I'm not that, then who is? So right. having having the people that they trust is is important. Yeah, I was curious, you know, your experience as a former student athlete at Pitt and seeing the changes you've made, um, what do you think uh, was the biggest change you've made um, for student athletes to be able to to help build that life, those life skills? Hmm. That's a great question. And, uh, you know, I'm one that I don't I don't sit well with success points. I try to keep moving forward and forecast ahead. So For but sure. I will say um, our biggest, biggest asset to the department is our capabilities and ability to build relationships with our student mm -hmm. athletes while they're here and continue that on as they are alum because we also oversee our alumni engagement. So the last 17 years I've been in this role, every single one of those graduates, we still keep in touch with because as alumni, which we call Forever Panthers, we run the reunions, we, we run celebrations, and we also still provide support, um, mainly in the career development space. So if you graduated five years ago and you're looking to transition careers, we will be happy to review your resume or your CV, also plug you into different networks of the industry you're trying to go into and get you connected with other alum or contacts in the state that you're looking to move to. I think one of Penny's biggest, um, biggest assets is his ability to hold space. And by doing that, he's allowed his team right to hold space. Because if you think about so much of our student athletes' lives are scheduled and out of their control. And so sometimes it might take them a minute or an hour or days to like get up the gumption to say the thing that they wanna say. And I will say that I, I think that that, Penny's example and the life skills team, they, they do a great job of that, of right, like not being a clinical person in these student athletes' lives, just being a vulnerable other human that's willing to sit with you while you messy cry right? Or like willing to go and go get some ice cream with you. Right. I think that those are, those are the pieces. It's, um, and he doesn't try too hard, right? Which I, I, I say that's like jessling, but it, it's real. It comes across as so genuine. Yeah. Super genuine. I was about to say, yeah. when you try too hard, sometimes it feels that the athlete, you know, they're people, they're not stupid. You know, they, 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 they yeah. can tell when people are trying too hard and enforcing that that connection so just you know being yourself around them makes them want to be themselves around you yeah i think one of the other things right is that that continuation of your roster 
right? Like who's on your support staff, who's on your team when you leave, right? And those are some skills that we talk about with our getting ready to graduate or exit seniors is you've had this team. Now it's time for you to build your mm -hmm. roster and who do who gets the privilege of earning space in your life, right? And I think that these are really important, right? Like choices that maybe you never got to handpick all your coaches before. Right. But now you get to pick your cheerleaders, your financial advisors, your hype man, like the person who's going to hold you accountable. You get to be the CEO of your own of your own company. Right. And I will say one thing that I love about the NIL is like not only are we talking about savings account and Roth IRAs, we're talking about LLCs and taxes now. Like mm -hmm. I'm I'm yeah. here for it. <laughs> no, I, I totally yeah. agree. I mean, I think honestly, I'd love to hear about you know since the NIL has has became a real thing, you know, your experiences with the life skills program and how you've kind of added in those NIL um, attributes into the, into the program and, and just how you work with athletes on, on taking, you know, advantage of those opportunities, because I think they're well-deserved opportunities and it's allowing athletes to have their own brand and their own identities. Yeah. Yeah. And outside of their sport. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Well, to add, add uh, additional points to Kristen's comments, one, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that, that uh, you feel that I come off genuinely. That's my goal, and it is my true nature. Um, but to add add to it, you know, when you are able to build and you say your circle, we call it your personal board of directors or your, your very finite circle, we incorporate that into our lesson plan for our transitioning student athletes. Um, to talk about networking and relationships. You know, Kristen Lee and, and our, our mental health team, when we first designed the first year course, relationships was the foundation. Mm -hmm. It's important for, for our student athletes as they start their experience to continue those relationships and, and identify them. And same thing with them as they transition out. Um, you know, part of our lesson plan is who do you go to for specific advice? You know, you don't always have to go to one person for your financial advice. What if their finances are in shambles, right? So you've got to build your own personal board of trusted people. So we designed uh, one of their assignments to be that. Um, and then in, in regards to NIL, you know, <laughs> I think it was the whole country was trying to figure it out. It's like building a plane while you're flying it, right? Um, sure. And, and the reality hit that, you know, these are real opportunities. And I am I am very appreciative that the mindset that I know at Pitt is that our student athletes come first. Mm -hmm. So as we were designing it, we, we designed the program called Forged Here, which means who you are, what you want to do, your brand, you forge here at Pitt first and you grow it and let the rest of the world know. So right. we in Life Skills, we are one of four department units that creates that Forged Here um, program. For us, we oversee the education portion of our student athlete experience. So we partner with um, various departments. Um, we had lawyers, entertainment lawyers from around the country come in and talk about how do you read contracts. We've had um, the Cats Business School Center for Branding do a workshop with us and our student athletes on how to develop and enhance their personal brand. But what I'm more excited about is as we went through this first year of really discovery and, and learning in all, all those pieces, we've become more proactive in making sure we're onboarding our own knowledge, our own space. So I took a group of student athletes with me to the NIL Summit that was held in Atlanta. And it was eye-opening on so many different levels. One, it was a true space for student athletes. It wasn't the area where, you know, you see athletic directors and top executives. You saw executives, but it was executives from WWE, Meta, right. Influencer, um, you know, Instagram, like these top global brands were there specifically for the student athletes. And it really dawned on me personally that here's a tremendous opportunity. And now I'm working with those student athletes who attended with me for peer to peer education, because we have we have some NIL experts in our own athletic departments 
who are student athletes. Mm -hmm. They're succeeding at a high level. So why, why not pour into them and give them additional skill sets on how to develop not just themselves, but others? Right. Yeah, for sure. Everybody can benefit from it. Right. And, and if you really want to strengthen their own learning, we, we've heard that saying the best way to learn is to teach. Yeah. So sure. empowering our student athletes to do so is, is what I'm looking forward to in the next um, the next year. I think the thing from NIL that I, I didn't feel surprised by, but I think lots of people were, is that specifically at Pitt, we have had quite a few student athletes use their platform as fundraisers, mm-hmm. right? For local communities, for a global community. But everyone kind of had these preconceived notions of like, what would this bring? And I think we've really seen our athletes show us what is the most important thing to them. Like in this moment where they're able to make some money, they're willing, they're willing to put it out there that this is a cause that feels really important and close to me. And I'm going to use my platform and I'm going to, I'm going to create change there. And I think just by that kind of venture from our student athletes, like that vulnerability to say, this is something that's important to me, but then to put themselves out there they're already practicing their post-college skills, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're getting this opportunity to to make their LLC, to make their actual board of directors, to fundraise, to to do all of these things that most of us didn't get to do until well after our college careers were over. Um, So, I mean, I'm I'm excited for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's pretty interesting. Absolutely. Um, so we're almost, you know, we're almost out of time here and I, I really appreciate this conversation. I want to ask you guys one last question is, you know, we're, obviously you guys are, are both at a, a very premier uh, university and in a, in a major conference for small schools and, and D2s and D3s and junior colleges and, or high schools or whatever it is. Um, what are some, what's some advice you could give to, to helping athletes develop those life skills, whether it's starting a life skills program of their own or just working with athletes one-on-one, what's the best advice you could give for, for that kind of situation where maybe the resources aren't as plentiful? I think it's to take an inventory, right? A personal Mm -hmm. inventory. What are you good at? What are the areas that you can work to be better at? And what are the areas that are no longer serving you? because you didn't get to wherever you are in athletics by luck. Like you and I didn't have the same shot at, you know, getting a football scholarship. It wasn't a toss up. And so how did we each get to where we are athletically by personal qualities and characteristics and really, really recognizing and honing in on them, I think is a way to get started for life after sport. I always challenge people to have a plan 1A right? Some, not always the biggest hit with coaches, right? Like we should have just one plan. And what happens if that doesn't work, right? Right. Like what happens if life throws an audible, right? Like what happens if we have another global pandemic, right? How are you going to manage that? And when sports is all consuming, it has this sense of impending doom if it doesn't work out. And so you need to be able to say, this is what I'm good at. Here's how else it shows up in my life. And oh, by the way, none of these things are who I am. They're just what I do. Right. Mm. I think that's it. I love that advice. And I'm about to take notes, Kristen, because I think at 40 years old, I'm going to do the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For me, very similar to what Kristen Kristen has said is um, my advice is first hear the words you are more than an athlete Mm -hmm. hear it and then absorb it and pause on it and explore those other elements that when you wake up in the morning and your feet hit the ground what are you most excited about what are some of the things in your day that you look forward to but also who's in that space with you because sometimes when you are by yourself trying to go watch a movie you know some people are comfortable with that but others they enjoy sharing that that space with someone 
for example, for me in my own personal experience, coming into Pitt, I had those opportunities in high school. Football was football season. Then I was doing musicals. I was playing the viola. I was in quartets. But I recognize not everyone's as extroverted as I am. So I ask our student athletes, well, what are those moments for you? And we have student athletes who just like to sit under a tree and read. Well, what about that? Is it the storylines? And we just dive a little bit deeper into those spaces. It's really trying to identify and, and take that inventory of those spaces and things that you enjoy doing and see if you can explore it towards a different purpose. That's amazing. Thanks so much, guys. And, um, you know, if, uh, you know, we could have you back on eventually to talk more about this, I would love it. I think it's such an important conversation um, and the work you're doing to, to help bridge that gap of, of building those life skills is phenomenal. So thank you and kudos to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.